Hey, we are live and I see our attendees are trickling in. So welcome everyone. We're going to spend a couple minutes just chit-chatting and catching up to allow for folks to join us so they don't miss anything critical right off the bat. How are you all doing tonight? We're good. Great. Good. I feel like we used up all of our introductory banter prior to going yeah. on, so we'll have to recycle some topics, but I mean, hey. <laughs> Good. How's Chicago for you? Great. Um, I was able to secure, procure, obtain several avocados this weekend. Oh. We'll be having oh. food the next couple of nights until the last avocado is gone. I was so excited. That is a bounty and a blessing in these days. <laughs> Carrying them back like I had, oh my God, like <laughs> something like gold. I was like, yeah like carrying the avocados myself in my arm. <laughs> avocados, flowers, yeast, these things I took for granted and now cannot find to save the life of me. It's true. It's true. It's not, not ideal, but we're all going to make do and, and muddle through. Yeah, we have new gratitude for our groceries, for our very simple I've, things. So. Absolutely. I'll never look at an avocado the same way again. <laughs> But speaking of femininity, I have a joke that like the pandemic has made a woman out of me because I like cook and clean every day now. So it's like... <laughs> made of, yeah, out of me too. <laughs> I love to hear it. I won't lie. Uh, All right. So we've given, I think we've got a pretty nice quorum of attendees here. So I'll just start to, I'll kick off with a little introductions before we move to our conversation at large. So... Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Schofield Manser. I'm the Assistant Director of Special Events and Partnerships at the ART, and I would love to welcome you all to ART Not Without Ambition. And I'm so fortunate to be joined today by Whitney White, who's the creator of Macbeth and Stride, unfortunately postponed due to the current situation. I'm also joined tonight by Professor Ramey Targoff of Brandeis University, Professor Stephen Greenblatt of Harvard University, and we're going to have a conversation focused on all things Shakespeare. So my deepest gratitude goes out to the three of you for your very kind participation. And I'd also like to very quickly thank our supporters. Thank you for tuning in this evening. We all find ourselves navigating the same unprecedented crisis, and we hope that the ART is able to share a moment of joy with you tonight. So a quick bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Uh, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the hour for Q&A. But please feel free to submit questions at any point in our conversation using the Q&A feature at the very bottom of your screen. You can type in a question. We won't get to it till the end, but if something sparks your curiosity as we talk, feel free to send it our way. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's kick off with a topic that I think is hot on everyone's mind. Um, so Stephen, Macbeth was allegedly written during an outbreak of the plague, and many of our supporters have come out to comment on the, the coincidence between that fact and the fact that we had to postpone Macbeth and Stride due to the COVID crisis. Um, and Macbeth and Stride would have celebrated its opening night this past Saturday. So this conversation is very timely. What's your take on that topic? Well, it isn't hard to say that uh, about any Shakespeare play that it came out in some relation to the plague because it was <laughs> uh, something that haunted him from the you know, year of his birth all the way through to the end of his career. Uh, the theater was closed when the death numbers uh, were above 30, or at least that was the official uh, figure, although uh, for, uh, deaths of plague in a given week above 30, uh, but it varied. But we do know that in the years, there was a horrible outbreak of plague in 1603, 64. Then in 1605, there was a major terrorist attempt, uh, the gunpowder plot to blow up the government. And then in 1606, uh, Macbeth probably is, came out, but the season was shortened because of a outburst of play. But the tricky thing, Sarah, is that though it was all over the place for Shakespeare, he very, very rarely uh, refers to, represents it in any direct way. And the interesting thing in relation to tonight's occasion is that the greatest description of a country in the grip of plague in his entire 37 plays comes in Macbeth. Uh, it's when uh, Macduff asks how things are going. They're in exile at that point in Scotland, and this is what Ross says. Uh, Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. 
It cannot be called our mother, but our grave, where nothing but who knows nothing is once seen to smile, where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made, not marked, where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. The dead men's knell is scarce, is there scarce asked for who? And good men's lives expired before the flowers in their caps, dying or ere they sicken. It's an incredibly powerful account of what it must have felt like. But the weird thing is that it's not a description of a disease. It's a description of politics. It's a description of what it is like to be in a country with a miserable, corrupt, lying, criminal leader, oh, someone indifferent cool. to the lives of those whose protector he's meant to be, someone who's lost his moral bearings, someone who has blood on his hands. And for Shakespeare in Macbeth, that's what it means to be a country in the grip of a plague. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's interesting, uh, Sarah, is that we're about to have an election and actually King James was unable to enter the city of London and unable to assume the throne after Queen Elizabeth's death in 1603 because of plague. So there was this, may it not happen to us, but there was this long delayed period when in effect there was no physical ruler. So the queen mm. would ruled this extraordinary queen, which is something Whitney is really interested in, uh, had just died. And what prevented the ordinary transfer of power in 1603 was, was plague. So it was also literally politically putting a kind of pause on the political process. It's been a while since I took early modern history, but I do not think anyone ever shared that with me. So that's fascinating. Thank you. They were actually like hanging outside of London, waiting to be able to enter the city. And James was very nervous about it. I mean, James was tremendously, and rightly so, tremendously anxious about getting into any place with a lot of people. Uh, in general, he was nervous about being with a lot of people, but the, uh, and the plague conditions particularly. So he was nervous generally, and then the plague exacerbated that feeling? Exactly, and rich people huh. in general tended to get out of town as quickly as possible when there was outbreaks of plague. Wow, they say that the past repeats itself, and it's feeling, it's feeling mighty present right now. <laughs> I think that's my favorite detail about Shakespeare's kind of enduring time with the recurring plagues in 1603 and 1607 is that he did not desert London. Mm. Um, he did not desert the theater and he came back to it uh, even more vigorously than before. And that that is very encouraging to me right now. The idea of not deserting an art form just because the current the current time we're in presents challenges to the art form, because I feel mm. like so many conversations about, well, how can we make theater digital? How can we make TV content? How can we make podcasts? How can we turn this into that so that people can see it? But some things are just meant to be theater, and I find it very inspiring that he did not abandon London, you know? And there were so many times where they did, as Stephen said, open and close and open and close the theater, and they kept trying to do it. So we just have to keep trying to do it, you know? And we and he, will. He seemed to save up things, and so they sort of exploded out of him once the theater opened up again. So it wasn't just... Macbeth, but Macbeth and Lear in a given season. I mean, it was a set of things that he must have been writing when the theaters were shut down. I love the passage you read. I literally almost cried because in mm. Lear, it's also really briefly mentioned, but when Lear is outside with his fool in the world, if he sees all the people on the street that he's neglected, the people who are most vulnerable to plague, he kind of has this beautiful uh, several lines and at the end of which is like, I should have done more basically to prevent this. So if anything, like the way I see how plague operates and affects the work is like, he shows us these rulers who are not doing what they're supposed to do to protect the most vulnerable. If anything, that's how I see it affecting the work. Like Lear and Macbeth are like just really problematic people in past <laughs> who are not considering the common good. So, yeah. Interesting. Well, that sort of dovetails nicely into the next question that I'd, I'd like to ask, which is that so when, in Macbeth and Stride, Whitney, you write, love or ambition? Shakespeare says you can't have both. 
And my question for all of you is, is this true? And how does this concept show up in Macbeth and in other Shakespeare's pieces? Well, for me, it's very specific in which, it's very specific who is allowed to be ambition, ambitious and who is not. In the Henry, mm -hmm. Henriette cycle, it's a really specific, young, dominant voice that is, is allowed to kind of rise to the top, right? The rulers that rise to the top in the right way. Or if you look at Richard III, you know, and Richmond, and like, who's allowed to be the victor at the end. But most commonly in these stories, if you're a woman, you are not allowed to be both ambitious and in love, from what I observe. It's likely if you try to do that, you will kill yourself by the end of the play or something terrible will happen. <laughs> or mysteriously wander into some water and be found with your clothes perfectly covering your bosom. You know, very Botticelli there in that description. <laughs> Female suicide. Um, and so my question is, why is it that this, these narratives, um, Western narratives, kind of reaffirm the fact that it's really hard for a woman to be ambitious and powerful and in love? Like, why is that a mm. deadly trifecta in... Cleopatra, Romeo and Juliet, Richard the, not Richard the Third, but um, Macbeth, the one that we're talking about tonight. So I'm just curious about it. I don't have all the answers about it, but when I look at the plays, I look at Ophelia, I look at Juliet, and you look at Lady M, it's like, what's going on here? These women who want so much when, you know, of the world are dead by the final act. What, what is that about? I, I mean, I think... We probably have to separate these out because we can't forget that Lady Macbeth is, is a murderer and a monster. So when we talk about ambition, we have to also think about the quality of the ambition. But what's interesting is that as your play, I think, uh, really explores in a wonderful way the erotic energy between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth is precisely when they share their ambition, when it's a common ambition. And then they're sort of the sexiest married couple in all of Shakespeare. They're the only couple who seems super affectionate with one another. We talked about this the other day. We knew they call each other nicknames and sort of, you know, are, are seem incredibly uh, intimate and tied to one another while they're on their way up. And then once they've achieved what they think is their goal, it turns out not to make them so happy. And then things start to unravel. But there's a sort of moment early in the play or the first act or so when actually their love and their ambition seem totally intertwined and in fact to be a man or to be a woman uh seems to depend upon this this sort of shared ambition so what's interesting is how how little the love seems to be sustainable once the ambition has been realized and that actually connects as you mentioned Richard III in interesting ways to plays like Richard III where the sort of erotic hunger that he has um, needs to keep moving through love objects, right? That women need to be sort of pushed aside. Yeah. I mean, I also would posit, I hear what you say in, differentiation, in differentiating the nature of ambition, but like for my analysis, it's actually really important that I don't do that. Because for me, whether you are monster, as Lady M is, or whether you are meek, as Amelia is, and Juliet is, and Ophelia is, the analysis is the same. If you want something in that system, it has fatal outcomes. So my question is, why is that? I think goodness isn't a part of it. It's more a critique of gender in the system and how gender operates within a system that stratifies people based on difference. But I hear you. There are, you know, if you start looking at the women in a moralistic way, it can yield a different thing. But for me, it's like whether you're a working class person who has to serve your husband's friend, like Amelia does in Othello, or you're a queen who gets her hands dirty, it, or you're Ophelia who's just in love. You get your head cut off by the end. And so what is that about, you know? I think that uh, it, it's the case that Shakespeare grew up in a world in which the remarkable female ruler uh, of the country precisely didn't get married, couldn't, whatever she felt toward Lester, toward whomever, uh, whatever she did secretly could never be acknowledged because she would have lost her power. Yeah. Uh, or at least she had every reason to fear that she would have lost uh, her power had she married. So certainly for a woman, it's different for a man, obviously, as you've said, but for a woman in this period, 
to at the, at that level, at the highest level of society, uh, it would uh, have been fatal for ambition to uh, have it subsumed by love. And in some ways, in Macbeth, that's why Lady Macbeth's power has to operate through instigating her husband to do the deed. Uh, it, it's largely through sexually taunting him, uh, mm -hmm. but to get him uh, to screw his courage to the sticking point, yeah. as, as she says. I love that. I kind of, I'm going to have to write that down. Like the ambition could be subsumed by love. That, that also should go. You're definitely getting a shout out in the program when we get this thing up. Cause that's like exactly the problem. And we have this phrase now, well, you can't have it all. And my question is, well, damn it. Maybe I want it all. <laughs> How can I explore that? Place? Well, I'm with Ramey though, Whitney, that it, I think it's great that you should have it all, but, but you shouldn't have it all through, uh, a kind of shared act of criminal of course. violence against <laughs> that is to say we're dealing with the with the Ceausescu family in yeah. in uh, Macbeth with people who've actually come together through murder. Right. Correct. But it turns them on. I mean that's that's what they're it's like Richard the Third and the what motivates them, what gets them excited is the prospect of crime. And so they're they're a, it's a folie à deux it's just a question of who can hold on to his or her sanity at which point. I mean, that happens to, to fall first and then, you know, she does later, but, but they're undone. I mean, I, th I guess I say that only to say, I think it's really hard to take the ethics out of Macbeth um, because the play turns on, they fall apart completely as a couple, as psychologically stable individuals, you know, once they've done this, this deed, which in, in not just in their culture, but in any culture is, you know, one of the one of the worst things you can do, but certainly, certainly in, in Renaissance England. So we were gonna talk about this a little later in the program, but I feel like it makes sense to pose this question now. And we've been talking about the relationship and the marriage between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth um, and how they seem to have the most quote unquote successful marriage in Shakespeare's canon. But is their relationship a happy one? How are we defining success for them? I think, you know, my analysis of the relationship, especially in exploring it with my guitarist and uh, men that are in my band when we're working together is, um, while it feels very passionate, especially, there, there, there's a lot of evidence for passion and heat and affection. Mm -hmm. And there's as much evidence actually for dysfunction. And I think that's actually apparent in almost every heterosexual portrait of love that Shakespeare has it's actually really key to my analysis like none of these couples romeo and juliet antony and cleopatra lady i mean they're not this isn't healthy you know the things that they're doing the way that they exhibit love towards each other you know um uh locking yourself in a suicide pact with someone so i think success um is an interesting term i think affectionate and acknowledged i would i would use those mm -hmm. terms because the first letter he sends to her, he calls her my dearest partner of greatness. And he says, I have to deliver this news to you. You know, there's all this kind of collective experience that's evident in the language between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. And so that is very sexy and positive. Yes, there's communication between the two at first. And the fact that he wants immediately, his first instinct is to rush off and write her a letter which is extraordinary. And by the way, I just, this is a good moment to mention that the first time we meet Lady McGrath, she's doing something that only 3% of women, somewhere between 3% and 10% of women could do, which is to read. Mm. And so we meet her as an educated woman reading a letter, which already, as I say, differentiates her from the majority of people who would have been attending the theater, but also suggests that they're intellectual partners in a way, that they're, they're planning together, they confide in one another. There's so many moments in Shakespeare, you mentioned in the Henriette earlier, uh, you mentioned the Henriette, but there are moments where men refuse to share or think about uh, one of my favorite lines spoken by a wife in all of Shakespeare is when Portia uh, in Julius Caesar says that she doesn't want to dwell in the suburbs of Brutus's affections, right? That she wants him to share the plan that he has. And so very often we see men absolutely refusing to share with women, and that taps into all of the misogynistic accounts of women 
being gossips and unable to keep secrets and unable to keep their word. And so I think it's a really important moment that the very first sign of their relationship is this confidence, this confiding in her, and that she is holding a letter that he has written specifically uh, for her alone. I think that that's true, but I think of them as intellectual partners, but not as emotional partners mm -hmm. exactly, because when she's reading the letter, she is also analyzing the defects of his character. He's not, he, that, he has too much of the milk of human kindness in him. And then they're on a kind of, they're, they're strangely sort of passing. With, uh, she at the beginning of the play is icy and he's all trembly. And then they meet at the murder. Mm -hmm. And then she, he, he becomes all icy and sort of dead inside and she's all trembly. So they're in a curious way, except for the moment in which they commit the crime, which is the moment that they're somehow both there, they're moving in different directions. So by the end of the play, he says, when she's told she's dead, should have happened thereafter, there would have been a time, he says, as if, as if he doesn't care at that point, as if it's all over anyway. It's that trajectory. I work with a really brilliant directing duo, Tavi McGar and Tyler Dabrowski, but exactly the way you describe that trajectory is how we kind of plot the music in our piece. It can feel like, my character, the woman, Lady M, has a very particular sound, and M, Macbeth, has a very particular sound. And you can kind of feel that emotional, like, seesaw, those shifts in the middle of the night by how the music starts to fracture and progress in the show. Um, you really feel that in the piece. Whitney, do you have music throughout the show? Yes. So the piece is almost completely... You could consider it a musical. We don't sing about like uh, the actions we're going to do in the way that like a Rodgers and Hammerstein show would do. You know, you're like, I'm ghost. Like it's not that kind of a thing. Uh, but the music is actually made to follow an emotional landscape, which is why it is very much on this thing that you're talking about, Stephen. And so the music is a tool that gives you access to the character's inner lives. How feel what's going on what's moving them and what's driving them and because the whole show is performed like a concert with a band on stage it's very much music for an audience to digest along with the Shakespeare oh, and some of the music would be likely recognizable to a lot of our audience right yes I've got a couple clips lined up if you want to share a little snippet of one or both of them Whitney sure that's great why don't we do um Mountain High. I think I should preface by saying in this piece, this adaptation uh, of Macbeth, you know, it's called Macbeth in Stride because I centered it on the woman's experience, on Lady M's experience. Mm. Macbeth is in stride with her. So when she gets the letter, our show starts when Lady M gets that letter that Remy was talking about. And then she's like, let's do it. Let's be king and queen. And I love it. Lot. And so this is the song that Lady M sings in kind of full protestation of her commitment to taking Duncan down. Oh, I love that. So we're just going to play a little brief clip. We're not going to play the whole song because we have so much conversation to get to in the next 15 minutes. But can you all see this on your screen? Fantastic. Yep. All right, let's let's listen. It's <laughs> It goes against my... <laughs> my better nature to do so, but the, in the interest of returning to our conversation, wow, that's incredible. It's like everything Stephen and Remy are talking about, like in Tina Turner, like the success of their marriage. I was like, I know I need a love song because these are two people that like have chemistry. You know what I mean? And like you said, they're intellectual partners. There's like heat there. And I also needed something really fast to be like, I'm all in, you know, because Lady M, she has no pre-beat. It's just letter. Okay, let's do it. And she just wants to do it in this kind of insanely contemporary way to me. And so that song kind of just like connects all the wires really fast. And it's a great American classic. It is. This also seems like a good time sort of jumping around slightly again, so forgive me. Um, Whitney, can you talk us through your creative process and talk about the development of this character? We keep talking about 
Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, and then we talk about Lady M, and I would love to explore sort of what your concept of Lady M is and how it differs from the traditional representations. Oh boy, I'm about to sound like the biggest <laughs> that ever was. Here it goes. Okay, so basically, I'll never forget the first time I was kind of charged with reading that piece. I was in an mm -hmm. MFA program at Brown. I had to give a huge uh, shout out of thanks to the faculty and that program because I never thought that I would be able to kind of take ownership over the stories I was looking at in such a way. And we were assigned uh, for our final year an assignment to do a thesis, which was a half hour performance of whatever you want. And I was like, dear God, what am I going to do? And so I was like, I love leading women. I love strong women. I love rock and roll. And I love Macbeth. And I couldn't quantify how, I couldn't really put together how all those three, three things kind of connected. And I just kept analyzing the text. Mm. Eventually, I was like, well, really, let's be real. You're interested in Lady Macbeth. So I deleted every word that was not uttered by her. And I put all of her text into a document, like it was a continuous kind of stream of consciousness. And I read that over and over and then I got in a rehearsal room and I started singing and moving and trying to just put it together and Tina Turner kind of came out of that um, but specifically Tina Turner when she was with Ike that is the period of music where emotionally the text matches up almost directly to Lady M's kind of trajectory and descent ultimately um, and so slowly after I understood what the musical discipline was, I was like, this has got to be like vintage American rock and roll. Like to me, there's something very scrappy and rough about Macbeth. You know, they're in Scotland. They can't quite kill the king. They can't quite get it together. They're hallucinating. There's a kind of very ragged um, aspect to that couple. They're scrappy. They're not so glossy, you know? So I knew I wanted like a rock sound that, sounded rough you know before we started putting robots in all of music and that takes you to the 60s um so then i started putting in macbeth's text around her so that you could understand what's going on and understand the world but she could still somehow be the center of it and the whole piece basically takes place from when she gets that letter to when she kills herself and this kind of awesome I think it's awesome, hour and 20 minutes of material. And so Macbeth and Stride is the first of five pieces I'm trying to do this way. Each one, you know, centered around a woman and then gives you pepperings and, and kind of footholds of the story of Shakespeare's beautiful plots um, and plans that he lays in these plays. But kind of ultimately excavating the question, like, is ambition fatal? Whether you're a monster or not. And I think, yeah, that's just the journey of the work. It's just that question. Like, I'm chasing that question from woman to woman. Um, it starts with Lady Macbeth, and then we go to Amelia of Othello, Iago's wife. And then we go to Cleopatra. And then we go to Romeo and Juliet. And the fifth one is a surprise. Um, he tries a different tactic altogether. So yeah, that, that's the work. And each woman has a different musical discipline. So Lady Macbeth and Macbeth feels very much like vintage rock where Cleopatra is kind of fabulous. So for that one, we do Prince, you know, and Radiohead, like more glossy sounding music. So mm -hmm. as the people change, so does the emotional core of the piece, but the question remains the same. Oh, I can't wait to see that all come to life on stage. That's so, <laughs> well, that, I think it, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that sort of the, the back end of the creative process with us. And I like that you touched on the fact that you're sort of highlighting and amplifying the voices of, of Shakespeare's women characters that often are sort of pushed into the background. Um, and that brings us to another topic that we, you know, we could discuss forever, let alone the next 10 to 15 minutes, but the topics of sex and gender and sexuality are super present in Macbeth and in every other Shakespeare piece that I can think of off the top of my head. So um, to open the floor on, on that topic, Ramey, can we talk briefly about the obsession with motherhood and maternity in Macbeth? Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating subject. One of the <laughs> first pieces of literary criticism I ever read um, was an essay by... Uh, 
I think it's Elsie Knight, is that who wrote that, Stephen, do you remember? Uh, called, How Many Children Hath Lady Macbeth? And the point of the essay isn't really to answer the question. The point is to talk about how invested we get in characters' lives before and after the plays that we don't know anything. But the reason it's such an interesting question is that there's a possibly the most terrifying moment uh, in the play from the perspective of motherhood is when Lady Macbeth says, I've given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. And then you're thinking, okay, here's a sort of sympathetic moment where she's conjuring up. So first of all, we know that there once was a child, at least one child, who's no longer there. But then she goes on to say, I know how tender it is to love the babe. So you're imagining her, you know, nursing her baby. And then she says, I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. So this is a woman who is actually an experienced mother who has nursed a child and says, you know, my ambition is so, is so great. My desire to kill the king is so immense that I would do this, you know, it's sort of worse than Medea almost. I mean, the image of taking a nursing baby and dashing the reason. And that's just one of many mentions in the play of, of milk, of Macbeth still having too much of his mother's milk in him. That's how she describes him not being man enough. And then when she and her famous, I mean, the sort of the speech one would need to spend the most time on when, mm. when thinking about gender in the play is her unsex me here speech, where she says she wants to trade her mother's milk, her maternal milk for gall, that she wants to, in other words, hand over being a woman in order to achieve the ambition that she's trying to, trying to get to. So that also gets back to something Whitney's really interested in and interesting about in the play, which is, can you be a woman and be that ambitious? Or do you need, in fact, to unsex yourself? Do you need to stop being a mother, maternal, and so on? But we also know that there's a backstory here that's really dark and really troubling. I mean, something's happened to the Macbeth children or to the Macbeth child. Um, and when he says, have man children only to her, um, you should only give birth to man, you know, so they're, they're hoping to have more children, God help us, uh, but that doesn't happen. So I don't know, one thing that's interesting in, in your play, Whitney, is that there are no witches, and those are the other gender, gender trouble comes up about the witches, and I, I actually wanted to ask you why you, why you took them out. Well, it's a see oh man, I'm giving away my secrets, but it's all right. I love that question. If, if I'm honest, I tried to eat the witches myself, <laughs> character of Lady M. And I think like those tones of gender and also oddly in my mind, and you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I also tie it a lot to the kind of mystical, magical and weird secular aspects of Macbeth. But like the witches, there's a sequence in, in our piece, you know, the, the banquet scene when Macbeth starts to go crazy and see ghosts, you know? And we, we sing People Are Strange in that moment. And we extend the song into 6-8 out of 4-4 four, four, and like really turn it into a stopper. And it's kind of meant to be this acid-like fantasy. And if there were a place for the witches, ultimately they'd come out of that. But I try to think of Lady M and the witches as one expression of, of something. And like, I think it's more embodied when I'm on my feet in the character, the idea of possession and evil and magic with a K, you know, and the super weird powers that Lady M has until she loses her constitution and kills herself. So I feel like the reason why I didn't use their language was because the witches as a, 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 a tool was more evocative for me as for live performance. Like you'll see me do lots of strange things like crawl around or get behind my guitarist and play his guitar with him and all that physical life, I feel I channeled from the idea of a witch, someone with powers, you know? And thinking about the character of the witches, um, as we know, they, they are described in very, as stereotypical hags, sort of, and Banquo cannot gender them accurately. He can identify what he's seeing really well. And I remember having to write about this in, I think, a 10th grade English essay on what, what are the witches? Are they sort of independent agents of chaos? Are they... Do they fall sort of in a larger 
um, system of belief or what, what is the role that they are playing in the original Macbeth? I think it's very uh, deliberately made difficult to answer that question, mm. uh, whether you're in doing it in 10th grade. <laughs> uh, in, I would agree. Any other time. I mean, then say there, Shakespeare, I think, goes out of his way. Which which is say at a certain point, we'll do and we'll do and we'll do, but it's not clear what they do do. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it, 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 they're terrifying, that's for, for sure. And they're profoundly disturbing. And they're in Lady Macbeth or somehow involved in whatever Lady Macbeth is, as Whitney says. I mean, Shakespeare goes out of his way to suggest that there's some weird relationship between whatever it is that the witches are and, and Lady Macbeth. But he goes, I think, very carefully uh, out of his way to make it ambiguous as to how much power they have over anything. One possibility in the play, it's not part of our world any longer, and I, uh, is that all of this is somehow predestined, that, yeah. that however much Macbeth wishes to not to, to do this, He's going to do it because it's been settled that he's going to do it. That's what he is, as if he was, he was fated to be this hideous character and to have this catastrophic life and end. And that was something that was perfectly compatible with a very with, with Calvinism. Uh, and of course, this is a period in which witches were still being burned. James had a lively interest in witchcraft and had a. a very unpleasant track record when he was king of Scotland, especially in, as a specialist in burning witches. Mm -hmm. uh, so Shakespeare plays with it, teases you with it, but I think uh, if, at the very least, to come back to Whitney's point, if you're really worried about what's out there mm -hmm. in, this, in the Heath, you're better off worrying about your wife. You're better off thinking about what your relationship is in the most intimate part of your life because you're not going to figure out what's out there anyway. And the scary stuff is actually at home, the really scary stuff. <laughs> I love that. That's so delicious. Like, if you take the fact that, what are the question? What are the witches? There are three entities that are supposed to be feminine that terrify the men of the mm. planet are unexplainable. So if you take that most base definition, the three witches have to be feminine entities that terrify men and are not explainable. That opens it up. Your three witches could be three women in business suits that are CEOs. You know, what is, the, what is an example of an unexplainable woman? Woman. They could be transgender. There's like so many ways. It's like what a witch is and what a monster is is so dependent on the society and like the fears that we have. Like we make yeah. our own witches. You know, for them, it might have been the idea of a Calvinistic kind of fate-like presence. And for us, who knows what that is. They're called, as you know, as Whitney knows, they're, they're not called witches in the play, but weird, weird sisters, the weird sisters. Weird. They could be like your aunts. You don't want to see it. who are those people, you know? I love my aunts. Oh, my God. <laughs> we won't tell them you said that. Don't worry. This is, this is this confidence. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I, we have some incredible questions in the Q&A. So if you're all open to it, I think we can sort of turn the floor over to that. Let me get in here. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, here's a great one. So this is from Diane Proctor. She says, is Lady Macbeth ambitious for herself or for her husband? Was she really a monster or was she a woman who deeply loved her husband and sacrificed herself and her morality for his ambitions? Ooh, I mean, I think that she's a woman in love. I want to burn that. That's what I think. I can't wait to hear what Remy and Stephen think. But I do find her very much to be a woman who is capable of experiencing love, and she does with that particular man named Macbeth. Mm -hmm. I think that if I was living in a time in which the only way I could excise or act or 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 grab anything or do anything was through my husband's approval or behind him or making him do it so that I could have it, I could see myself becoming very ambitious for him because I can't experience anything unless he experiences it. So sometimes my analysis personally is rooted in the fact that for a woman to attain anything then, as is very often the case now, that 
that power, that ambition is predicated on the necessity that the man has to go for it. The man has to take the ax. The man has to be the public face of the home and therefore man maintain everything, property, money, everything. So if I wanted something, the only way to get it is to get him to get it. You know, mm -hmm. so when I start looking at it like that, like, yes, I'm in love. I say I as Lady M. Yes, I'm in love. But I also want this thing. But I can't get it unless he wants it. And I know he can be a little shaky. Then you've got like a good play, you know, where the lines between love and power are super blurred. Yeah, I think I have a less sentimental account of, of uh, Lady Macbeth. And I, I'm thinking about her reaction to the letter. When she first reads the letter, she has a very detached, cool analysis of her husband, which isn't the kind of expression of love one would expect um, if she were just sort of besotted. And she says, you know, she reads the letter, and then she says that she fears Macbeth's nature. She says, thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it, right? You don't have the wickedness that should accompany your ambition. So she's, she identifies him as a kind of, you know, somewhat inadequate uh, man through whom she's gonna funnel, you know, her energy and her ambitions. It's certainly, you know, she wants to achieve something through him, but I don't see it in, in response to the question. I don't see it as an act of devotion. I think, you know, Cleopatra is making terrible decisions in war <laughs> and, you know, her jealousy and her, Cleopatra strikes me as a ruler in love who's behaving often against her best interests. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see Lady Macbeth ever acting against her interests. I think she's quite cool until she loses it entirely. And I guess you could, we could have a conversation about why she loses it, but I won't, I won't go on. He says, by the way, uh, uh, Macbeth says, after that moment, after considering her, her proposal that they kill Duncan, he says, we'll proceed no further in this business. We're not going to go ahead with it. I don't want to go ahead with it. And then that's when she begins to taunt him. You're, you're not a man. Uh, so she, she, in some ways, this is, of course, what Whitney, you're suggesting, that she has a kind of, she's able to manipulate him that way be, to make him the man that she needs him to be. But it's, it's in the interest of something he actually, at this point, actively wants out of. He doesn't want to be this. Yeah. Uh, he says, I dare do all that may become a man. Uh, who, who dares do more is none. And then she says, well, what beast were you then? And so forth. Yeah. But that's why this is so great. This is why we are having this panel today. These plays, they... They make room for experience. And where Ramey says she finds it very cold, I find it very, in my experience as a Black woman, heterosexual woman in 2020, I totally equate her response with love. I can totally fall in love with someone, think about their shortcomings, dare to utter them out loud, weigh a balance, and then make a plan. You know, like it's, there's room for your experience with love to interpret her trajectory, because it's not colored through like 100%, there's room for interpretation. So that's why these plays, they're so good. They're so good. And sort of related to that point, but turning the corner slightly, we've got a number of questions about the women in Shakespeare's comedies and perhaps how their relationship to the subjects of love and ambition are treated differently. Um, and someone is saying she's thinking, they are thinking particularly of Viola in Twelfth Night and how Viola is, her ambition is treated very differently from that of Lady Macbeth. We can talk a little bit about that topic. I'm fascinated to hear the answer to this. I mean, when, when Whitney was describing the, the litany of women who don't get what they want, I was, I was making a secret list. Rosalind, Portia, <laughs> Viola, Olivia in a funny, complicated way. Beatrice, I mean, these are all women who get exactly what they want in a often very complicated way. But it is the case that the comedies, which are all about making marriages, um, mm. tend to have women who are, you know, Rosalind and Portia are among the smartest characters in Shakespeare's whole canon, and they 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 figure out ways to to 
as, as does Viola, to end up where they want to end up. Um, I was also thinking about Beatrice, and Beatrice, I just want to read, because when we think about women, sort of comic versions of Lady Macbeth, I would say, and because the situation is, is in some ways kind of comparable, when Beatrice is furious at Claudius, Claudio, excuse me, for humiliating her cousin Hero, for slandering her and so forth, in the scene in which Benedict and Beatrice finally are acknowledging that they're in love with each other, Beatrice gets incredibly angry that Benedict seems to be backing up from taking revenge. And she says, oh, that I were a man. Mm -hmm. What, bear her in hand until they come to take hands. And then with public accusation, she's talking about what Claudia has done to her cousin, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor. Oh, God, that I were a man. I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is just the strongest example of a frustrated woman who would, who imagines anyway, taking action when her fiance, boyfriend, beloved seems somehow emasculated or weak and, or inadequate. And I think it's not a coincidence that's, that's in a comedy as well. I, I want to say I love that moment too. She tells, she says to, as a love test, in effect, kill Claudio, she says to yeah. uh, Benedict. That, that's, so it really is uncannily like the Macbeth situation, but the happy version, because right. they're actually worthy of each other. Yeah. And they're the, almost the only couple that way, because the odd thing about your list, Ramey, is that it's true that those women get what they want, but why do they want that? Uh, they, 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 those are a succession of men that they get, with the exception of Benedict, who's actually kind of a interesting character, a cool character. But the rest of them seem terrible to me, I one know. way or another. I mean, That's why I, I think, I, I mean, you're going to convince me, Remy, I'm telling you. But, like, I think that's why I don't flock to those sometimes, the comedies, in terms of examining the women. Also because, like, as a Black woman interrogating this, I feel most interested in the women who are trying to push eject. You know what I mean? Lady M is like trying to push eject and fails very much to me. Amelia, she's like, hold on, hold on, I'm going to speak. She tries to push the stop button on the madness of the play and then fails. And then Cleopatra is just like, I'm not going back with you. Like, no, you know? So the women who are very vigorously saying, you know what? No, thanks. I feel very connected to them right now in this weird way. But you're right, I love Beatrice and Benedict. Gotta love them, they're great. They're such a great couple. Well, here's a question about everyone's favorite character, Lady M. Uh, what happens to Lady Macbeth between the banquet and the sleepwalking scene where she is completely unmoored? The shift happens off stage and is pretty drastic, it seems. And then the next thing that happens is her death. So uh, the question is what happens between the last time we see her, the sleepwalking scene and her suicide that we don't see what we do know is that, uh, one thing we know is that Macbeth has told her for the first time, I'm going to do something and you can wait and applaud it when I come back, when you hear what I'm going to do. It's fantastic. They're, they're, they're not sharing any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the sort of prelude to the banquet scene that I, I'm going to do something wonderful and you can applaud it. And that's the beginning of a set of things uh, it, leading up to the murder of Lady Macduff and the children, and the and the whole plague uh, of horrors that he's visited on the country. That that uh, she uh, is no longer depicted as part of. Uh, and the my sense, but uh, we'll see what Whitney and Ray think. My sense is that she's in effect written out of the of that collective criminality at, at that point and. It, things begin psychically to fall apart for her. I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think that um, of all of Shakespeare's <laughs> female characters, she, except for Ophelia, but we don't learn as much about Ophelia. I mean, we know what's happened to Ophelia. She's the one who is um, shown to be needing psychological help. She's the only one who actually has a doctor called in, and Macbeth famously says, you know, Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? So she's she's diagnosed as having um, some kind of psychological breakdown. And when you go back, if you if you think about that and you go back to earlier in the play, there are some weird moments where 
she shows signs of, of, you know, a vulnerability. She says she can't murder. She would have killed Duncan herself if he hadn't resembled her father, you know, which is a weird moment uh, and a sort of kind of little sign of, of, and she's constantly telling me about not to think about it too much, you know, to, to avoid thinking. And so mm. I can't think of another moment where we pull a doctor, I mean, the Verity's most spectacular aria in the, in the entire opera, and really uh, Lady Macbeth steals that opera, is the sleepwalking scene um, where the doctor and the nurse or her maid are standing there. <laughs> Lady Macbeth is, you know, just <laughs> extravagantly, you know, crazy. But, uh, but Shakespeare gives us a sort of early glimpse of a psychoanalytic breakdown here when he says, you know, Macbeth says, can't you raise out the written troubles of her brain? Can't you kind of? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I guess the short answer is she's, she's fallen apart. I mean, she's had a kind of psychiatric breakdown, whether it's because Macbeth has withdrawn from her, whether just the psychological burden of having done what she's done. I mean, the hand, the obsessive hand washing, which now in days of plague feels like a different matter, um, is actually, you know, about precisely getting rid of this guilt, which clearly can't be gotten rid of. And, and both of them at the beginning of the play have a fantasy that they can commit a crime that won't affect them psychically that way. Uh, a little water clears us of this deed, uh, Lady Macbeth says. And it turns out that's, the, in a way, the optimism of this tragedy, that you actually pay psychically for what you do. Uh, it looks like the, the leader, as it were, doesn't seem to have any internal psychic life at all. He's able to do whatever he wants to do. There are no consequences. But there are consequences, Shakespeare believed. In, in the case of Lady Macbeth, there's the uh, psychic breakdown. In the case of Mr. Macbeth, uh, he, he goes dead inside, absolutely dead. Uh, so that by the end of the play, he's like a kind of walking corpse. She's all fallen apart. He's just collapsed like a dead star in himself. We take it very hard, our creative team, this moment at the banquet that Stephen talks about in which he has turned away from her. And I think my collaborator, Tammy McGar and myself, you know, we shared quite openly times of being abandoned by your partner. And going back to the previous question about her love, I think her breakdown is totally a sign of that. Everything was good when they were together in it, but that moment in which he abandons her and turns away from her, is it's so damaging. And that's a very human experience that, you know, I interview a lot of women when I'm working on these pieces. Like I talk to women um, about these questions I have, because I'm certainly not the first person to put these questions together. And, and that moment when someone you're supposed to be in it with, especially someone you commit a crime with, you know, um, make connection. Yeah, turns away from you is psychically shattering. Um, mm -hmm. Many, many, many women, especially if that's someone that you are married to. Well, Whitney, this is another question for you. Um, you spoke earlier about how Macbeth and Stride is the first in, I believe, a five-part series sort of re-examining the women of Shakespeare. And I have a question wondering if you can speak more about how your character tracks through the cycle and how that character steps into each of these women as a, a different role. Well, I became very fascinated with video gaming because, first of all, you know, I am not a person who can sit on a video game for 30 hours, but it mm -hmm. is fascinating to me, these people who can, because the premise is simple. You get it, you go do this thing, and either you get there or you're killed. And when you're killed, you just start over again. And I'm like, that is such a weird purgatorial way to derive <laughs> pleasure to me. But the five-part series kind of operates in that way. And so the idea of my character is really kind of myself or a kind of shadow of myself, uh, mm. a, a woman living in the now in 2020, uh, a heterosexual Black woman who has goals and questions and is wondering how to get there and doesn't always go about the best way of doing it. Again, I would never condone murdering a king in his sleep. Um, but the way that they're all stitched together is like, I go in the Lady M, bloop, I jump into the level, let's call it a level, like in a video okay. game, of Lady M. 
and I fall into the story and try to navigate. And what happens at the end? Failure. Mm. So then she picks herself up and is like, let me try it a different way. She jumps into Amelia, who is quite essentially the opposite of Lady M. She's not a queen. She's not on the top of the socioeconomic food, food chain. She um, doesn't have so much to say. She doesn't always ha- isn't always the most eloquent with her words. She doesn't always speak up. But she is loyal to this man, so she tries it that way. Amelia also fails. We try another level. So let's go back to being a queen. I tried to be a regular schmegular Joe Blow. I don't want to do that. Let's try and be Cleopatra. Failure, you know? And so they're mm. stitched together by this woman literally hitting her head against a literal ceiling that is a narrative that keeps reiterating that these women die at the end, whether good or bad, young or old, rich or poor, queen or peasant. Um, and so it cycles through like that. And I like thinking of it as a game. Mm. We'll see. Can she get there or not? And if not, then why? Yeah, thinking of it as a video game level is a really unique descriptor for a series of theater. I'm really, that's so fascinating. I'm excited to see. Uh, One quick question. Is there any known historical basis for Macbeth? Someone is pointing out that there is allegedly a grave of a Scottish king named Macbeth on the island of Iona. Is this entirely fictitious or based in some amount of fact? Shakespeare got the story from, from the Scottish Chronicle by Hollinshed. Uh, so he certainly presumed it was an historical uh, event. Wow. And uh, the, char- the characters of the play uh, slightly changed in the names. Uh, Don Wald and Donald Bain and so forth are, and Malcolm, are historical characters. And Banquo was supposed to be the, the uh, ancestor of uh, James, the king, so that the there's a kind of compliment implicit in the play. Now, how much historical fact there is in these accounts, that's a different matter. But but there is some some conviction that there is a historical basis uh, for these events. I mean, I love that. That's like also reminds me of Othello because I totally snatched that from, I'm going to mess up the the Hecko. What is it? That series of 10 stories that Othello is kind of ripped from. By, by Gerald Gentile. Yes, and it's like, uh, that's also why I, I feel no shame when I'm adapting these plays, because Shakespeare was doing the same thing. I mean, like, he's brilliant. I'm not equating my Shakespeare. People, like, really match my own socks. But, like, you know, he's taking sources and looking at the world around him and then putting together these narratives. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I really want to go on a, like, trip. Can Harvard, like, sponsor us going to Scotland? <laughs> Really, we'll really talk like, off camera about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for one super quick, easy final question, but I am really interested in what each of you have to say in, in response to this. The question is, is it bad luck to say Macbeth in a theater? <laughs> I think the actor among us might have to answer that. <laughs> My master acting teacher, Brian McCraney at, at Brown Trinity, I, we were working on a, Othello at Trinity Rep three seasons ago, and I said Macbeth in the theater, and he made me turn around in a circle three times and throw some <laughs> over my shoulder. So there are strong theater people that are uh, uh, <laughs> very, very committed to that. But I guess the, the way that the saying goes is that if you're actually working on Macbeth, it's okay for mm-hmm. you to and since I'm technically always working on it, uh, I say it. I, th- I think uh, what I heard is if you don't call it the Scottish play, if you call it Macbeth, you have to take some Purell and put it in your <laughs> And wash your hands for 40 seconds. Wash your hands for 40 seconds. Use that Purell. And absolve right, and sing happy birthday. For times. There you go. New traditions for new times. Well, we're just about at seven o'clock now, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Thank you, all three of you, so much for joining us. This was incredibly edifying and so fun, and I'm incredibly grateful for you all being so generous of your talent, time, and energy. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, and thank you, everyone at home, for tuning in. We appreciate your support, and we hope that you're safe, healthy, and well. Have a good night, and tune in tomorrow at 12 p.m. for our next Lunch with Lunsford. Bye. Bye. Thank you.